Okay, there we go. I think, I think it's going. Yeah, I think it is. It is. Okay, great. All right, cool. Okay, Taylor, you ready to rock and roll? Let's do it. All right, let's go. So, Taylor, just uh, quickly introduce yourself here so we know who you are, what you do, and then uh, we can go from there. My name's Taylor Olson, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Slingshot. And Slingshot's a customer engagement solution for home services companies. We primarily service pest control and lawn care companies, and we help them uh, get to every lead, every customer need, regardless of the time of day, day of week, or, uh, or channel. You know, so we give them communication tools and an around-the-clock team that represents their brand and takes care of their customers whenever and however they want. That's awesome. So Taylor, before we hop into obviously the story of Slingshot, I just wanted to ask a random question uh, for you to get kicked off on the right foot here. Um, Quite a simple one, but a very, very interesting one to know somebody pretty well. Um, What is your favorite activity to do when you have nothing else to do? Work, take care of the family. What is that preferred activity? It's changed through the years, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm 36 now and we're in the slingshot seven years and, um, you know, taking a startup for that long and, and being one of the founders and CEOs, it, it, it extracts and demands your time in a way that you don't fully understand. And as you go through <laughs> that for a long time, like, you know, it, it used to be probably uh, going to the gym, you know, or yeah something like snowboarding or something a little bit more active. And now it's as simple as just watching a show, you know, like my (laughs) favorite thing to do right now is probably going for a drive late at night and just turning the music on or watching a documentary I've been wanting to get to. I mean, that's it. (laughs) Just being able to veg out a little bit and not have to think and enjoy some content is, is what I enjoy the most right now. (laughs) There's definitely something that is special about just having nothing to really, you know, call to or or go to think about when you're just idle, either on a drive, like I know exactly that feeling. And it's, it's pretty freeing. But it's, it's cool that you say that. So Taylor, um, I wanted to hop right into obviously the story of Slingshot and how exactly um, you decided to grow it and, and where it's at now in the processes that you took. Um, but why don't we just get started off with the initial idea of where did you come up with the idea of Slingshot? How did it even come about? So it started, I was in law school and was starting to think, gosh, I don't know if I want to practice law. Um, I had done a a lot of entrepreneurship activities and classes and started companies as an undergrad. So I already had experience starting companies in school, had a a decent idea of how it should be approached. And so I'm a year, year and a half in law school. And when I realized, well, I don't want to be an attorney, but I do want to finish this three-year program. Um, so over the next year and a half, two years, why don't I just start another company and see if I can get it off the ground and then I can be an entrepreneur. So just the beginning idea was, can I just get a business going of any category or any kind to make a living? Um, and wrote down a few ideas. And one of them that started to work on was what became slingshot. And at the time, the idea was simply to generate some leads for pest control companies online through building some small websites, running some pay-per-click campaigns, et cetera. Um, And then instead of sending those leads to the pest control company, like a marketing firm would do, we said, we'll pay for the ads and then we will take the lead ourselves and we'll convert it. So then what we're handing over to our client is a new customer, um, which we felt like maybe that would be more valuable and they would be willing to pay a little bit more for that. And we, thought that we could complete the loop. So we started to do that. Um, And it was, you know, it was a part-time project. We did it in the summer. Um, I was a full-time law student. So I was very Mm -hmm. busy with school and was only able to, you know, probably put in a couple hours a day on it. And we were getting a little bit of traction. We got probably 10, 15 companies to sign up. We were converting sales for them. Um, And it puttered along for eight to 12 months and never really got past that. 
And so we felt like, mm-hmm. eh, I don't really know if this is a business. It's kind of just a side project. Is there anything else this could turn into? And um, we decided, you know, at, at one point, my other two co-founders were, were not in school. And they were just like, hey, we need to probably make at least 10 grand a month as a company to take a decent salary or we're just going to have to call it a day. So we huddled up and said, is there any way to get to $10,000 a month within the next 30 to 60 days? And if so, what would that business look like? And we decided that we weren't that great at generating leads. We were really good at selling. Um, and we had put together a 24 seven sales approach between the few of us. So we could do it 24 seven. Um, so we kind of got to thinking, you know, leads that come in after hours that we've generated, uh, when we don't answer those and call them back the next day, we never convert them. They don't pick up. And so there's like this perishability of the lead that we've been trying to solve it on our own. And I wonder if our clients have that own issue like with their own marketing Mm -hmm. and, internal sales teams. And so within probably a 24 hour period, we, we sat down and made a new business and we just wrote it out on a single page and said, what we're going to do is we're going to support companies in their own sales process. And if they have a lead that comes in after hours that they can't get to, we will take it for them, ask, let them forward their sales calls to us. And then we will charge them a percentage of the revenue we sold. And um, that's all we'll do. And so we listed out, you know, what the phone system we would need to buy and put a one pager together for explaining the service. Um, and then we called a few companies and signed them up and, and we were off to the races. Huh. So going back to the beginning, I wanted to uh, dive a little bit deeper on when you had the first business model you were uh, getting leads and then you would sell these leads and basically give them to other companies. Um, If that is right, that's uh, a little scope of what I understood. But when you were doing that, you were running obviously these pay-per-click ads. Um, You had this system in place. What exactly were you doing when you uh, ran the pay-per-click ads? Like, was that, was that one of your co-founders that knew how to do Facebook ads or Google ads, or how exactly did you set the system up in the beginning when, um, it was, you know, going along for the 10 months, like you said, had a couple people, uh, make sales. Yeah. What did that system look like in the beginning? How did that even get created? Yeah, good question. So, uh, we had, uh, three of us that started the company. Uh, one of the co-founders was a sales guy and he had specifically sold pest control in college. So his job was to do all the sales and he would answer most of the calls. And then another one had a background in internet marketing and he had done a little bit as an undergrad and, and we'd actually done a little bit together. Um, so it was his job to run the pay-per-click campaigns on behalf of our clients to drive phone calls for people that were interested in pest control. So we'd set up a few of those campaigns, built a few websites and blogs that were um, specifically related to, to search terms that people would search for when they're interested for pest control in our yeah. client cities. Um, and so he'd build those and make sure that they were keyword rich so that they were ranking well in Google yeah. and then throw a number on there. And when people called the phone number, it went to our other co-founder's cell phone and he would answer it. That's awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> so Taylor, to move on from uh, obviously the second business model, when you first implemented that, how did you get your first clients when you knew that that was the next business model? That's how you're going to get to $10,000. How did you get the meetings with these other uh, pest control companies to start working with them? What did that look like? So we had, you know, probably, it was probably 10 companies that we were working with in some capacity on the original idea. And so we knew we could go to those 10 and see if this would work for them. But before we went to them with the the new idea, we wanted to kind of get the rust off and get comfortable like, like vocalizing it. So we just uh, typed in Google, you know, pest control in Utah and effectively just started calling some companies that we didn't know and asked for the business owner and tried to sell them on the new idea. Um, and as fate would have it, I think it was the first call we made was to a company in Utah that we didn't know. 
And we started explaining to them, hey, this is who we are. This is what we do. We answer pest control sales calls 24 seven. We'll only charge you if we make a sell. This is what we charge. Um, this is our experience. Would you be interested in trying it out for a month? And it was as simple as that. And the owner, he, he basically was like, hey, hey, you can stop. I understand what you guys are getting across. I, I get it, what you're doing. And I really like it. I think it's brilliant. So yeah, well, let's try it. What do I need to do to get started? And having like immediate success on the first one we called was a huge thrill and yeah. made us think maybe we're onto something. Um, so after that, we then started to call the 10 that were active clients of ours and a good chunk of them signed up too. So, you know, within a few weeks, we had a close to a critical mass of clients to get the idea wow. out the gate. That's awesome. How in the beginning, did you set up a website? How, how What was the first actual like product that Slingshot had in the beginning? Was it a website or was it really just you guys, you know, working as the salesman, talking to these people over the phone? Um, what was that first initial actual product that you guys had in the beginning? So I, I think, cow, my memory on it is a little bit hazy. At some point early on, I don't remember if we did it before our first call or not, but we built a website for our, our new business that became Slingshot to explain just the, the core concept of what we did, which all we were doing out the gate was answering calls after hours and selling them. And so on like a one pager, we just, um, you know, we just purchased a WordPress template that we liked, uploaded yeah. it into a HostGator account, filled out the titles, threw some images in and, and we had a website. And so hmm. we had that. And then we just had a fairly simple one pager that I had written up that also explained what we did in very simple terms. Um, just saved it as a PDF, put our logo on it, you know, created a little logo. And um, I think those were the only two things we had that we could show. Um, and then we just had ourselves and our ability to sell it and explain it. That's awesome. So, so moving on down the ladder, what, what was the time frame when you guys made your first hire? Where was the business at? Um, tell us all about this stage in, in Slingshot and, and the story of the first hire. Um, what, what did that look like for, for you guys? I'm trying to remember how long it took us to make our first hire. Memory serves me correctly. It, it wasn't that long. I think we were in it maybe three months. And so remember that along with just signing up new clients and setting up a phone system, building a website, just kind of the basic skeleton of our business we were doing. And then the three of us were also answering all of the calls that came in. So yeah. we, we were the 24 seven call center. So between those kind of two different needs that we had, it kept us really busy for um, a few months. And then I would assume it was by the time we were close to six to 10 clients, we felt like, oh, we've probably got enough volume. It appears it's working. Our clients have tried it for a month. They like it. We can probably go out on a limb and hire our first employee. And then we hired our first employee was, was a, a kid named Matt who had call center experience and um, he did an amazing job, you know, and he's with us for several years. Awesome. So I wanted to digress a little bit from the story and progression of Slingshot. I wanted to ask a question that I found uh, just from research online about the company and yourself. Um, it seems like there was a phase in the business where things weren't going so well. If I remember correctly, um, credit cards was something that you use just to pay the expenses of the business. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, it's fair to say that, that financially we were in a state of high risk and barely being able to pay our bills yeah. uh, for a while, you know, like definitely in 2014, when we started it, 15, 16, and even some of 17. So it was probably the first three years of our business. We had many moments where payroll was funded by my credit card. Uh, we had to get an emergency loan at the last minute to make payroll. We got a client that prepaid a year in advance to pay some bill that was due that, you know, within a couple of days. 
that type of stuff was happening consistently um unbeknownst to pretty much everyone but me you know i was over finances and so it um it didn't really make sense to scare everyone and to put that type of stress on on anyone else so yeah. it wasn't something that i talked about um and also i always felt confident that at the end of the day we could find a way i always felt like because we always did you know it didn't it didn't necessarily matter what the crunch looked like but it just was it felt like we're gonna we're gonna get the cash in the door somehow so we were always confident we'd get past the next month and the next milestone and i also had known enough successful entrepreneurs particularly those that self-funded to know that hey this is kind of part of it you know especially if you're going to grow fast like being short on cash isn't something that was unique to slingshot that's just part and yeah. parcel of growing a business. And so I knew that although it was stressful and risky, I knew that it was normal and that a lot of people had already tread that path and done it successfully. And so it never necessarily spooked mm. me, you know? Yeah. So kind of a follow-up question to that, I, I feel like would expose a little bit more of how this can be done uh, confidently and successfully going through hard times in a business, which for sure probably will come or a high chance that it'll come for a for a new entrepreneur, someone that is getting into the space, and then curious about what kind of things they could see for you personally, what would you tell them to best prepare for any sort of hardships in a business that really scare you or the company's growth? What kind of mentalities or, or things would you tell them to perfect think of just to make sure that they can make it through you know, the night, like sleeping in their, in their bed, if they can't even get to sleep because they're so worried. Uh, what are just some tactics you would tell them to, to really adopt to make sure that they can get through it confidently? Yeah, there's a concept that is probably a little bit overused now that uh, it is still true, just called grit, you know, and some people have studied yeah. grit and how it's a critical characteristic of people that are successful either in athletics, politics, or business. It's really important. And yeah. I, I think what they're getting at is a determination to find a way to get through even when it's really, really hard and to be able to do that over yeah. an extended period of time. And so anything that can be done, I think, to flex that muscle of a stick to itness and an unwillingness to quit, I think is helpful. And I, I, my experience is the best way to flex that muscle and build it is whatever you're working on right now, regardless of what it is, just commit to see it through and, and yep. put a milestone up on your wall. That's a goal with a date that you're going to try and achieve something by that date, or at a minimum, just not quit by that date. And so I had some stuff like that with slingshot where I, I never really felt like quitting was an option. Um, I was committed to staying the course for a long period of time. And so I was doing some things that are associated with grit. Um, and then I was also early on, I, I thought about, because I had a lot of school debt from law school, a lot, yeah. you know, and, and that was needed to be repaid six months after I graduated, the clock started yeah. to tick. And so it was very much on my mind, like, what am I going to do to make money? And if I don't make money, what am I going to do about my law school debt? And so I kind of got to this, worst case, what do I do if this fails situation early on, which for me, I had yeah. determined the worst case, I will move into my parents' basement and I'll live rent free because I didn't have a family at the time. And I'll probably have to declare bankruptcy, which is unfortunate. Um, but I will then get a job in law or I'll get a job in sales or business development, things that I was comfortable with. And I'll start to make an income. And I'll do that for a few years and yeah. uh, then I'll start another company and try again. And so that very clear understanding of what my worst case, if this blows up, which wasn't that bad, wasn't ideal, yeah. but it was living it with my parents and getting a job. It wasn't the end of the world. And so that took the edge off of failure and I felt comfortable failing. And I felt like if, if this doesn't work yeah. out, it's, it's okay. I'll have a second chance. And so I think people getting clear on what their life will look like if they fail and what their options are will probably take a little bit of the edge out of the fear and yeah. allow them to be more gritty and allow them to stick to it a little bit more. 
Um, so I would say those are two things that could could help out most entrepreneurs. Yeah. You know, I really think visioning that is something that's so critical. Um, I know I've heard of studies and whatnot that really signify how important something like a sporting event, if you're picturing yourself 15 minutes before, whenever you go on, you know, how you want it to go, you're envisioning that uh, very intensely. That's something that will give you like more confidence. Your, your brain will somehow, you know, feel more confident. I, I, it's not a quote for quote what I'm saying, but the philosophy is that just because of your, you're envisioning that sort of situation and your mind tends to believe that and, and see it in real time. So I think that's very interesting and very helpful too. But Taylor, while we're on this uh, topic in particular, um, sort of off of our, you know, ladder of, you know, seeing how Slingshot grew, I wanted to ask from your experience going door to door, having that, you know, uh, sales experience doing that, what can we learn from the door to door experience that would help us in a B to B sales experience or any other sales experience that we would need as an entrepreneur growing a company? Um, how could someone use like a, a door to door experience to, you know, tr transfer that to, you know, a, a B to B experience? Is there similarities? If so, what are those mm -hmm. that we can really uh, uh, learn? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think there's a lot. And I have a lot of respect for people that have the tenacity to go do door to door sales in any capacity. Um, and I really cherish what it taught me. Um, how I think it can relate to B2B sales is um, on the doors, it's helpful to back into your sales goal. You say, well, I want to get 100 sales over the course of the summer. Um, there's about 100 working days, so um, I need to get one a day. In order to get one a day, I probably need to knock on X amount of doors. And you can start to understand day in and day out. Okay, I need to knock on 50 doors. I need to talk to 20 homeowners. I average a sell per 20 that I talk to, and that's going to get me there. Um, and yeah. that's really helpful. And then you grind through it over the course of the summer. Um, and B2B sales, um, a, a big portion of it is the exact same. You start to understand how many companies you either need to email or call um, in order to get to enough decision makers to give a demo. And then you understand the percentage of those you're going to convert and you can hit your sales goal. And so those elements are almost the exact same. Um, and when you're cold calling over the phone or through email, um, it's a numbers game and you get rejected a lot and you just have yep. to get comfortable with that. Um, so I think that if someone was willing to do that on the doors, doing it in a B2B environment, um, I think they can absolutely be successful in. Yeah, that makes sense too. It totally breaks down exactly what people need to do every day. So they're not really confused on what exactly they need to accomplish that day to get to that goal. It's very uh, laid out for them day to day. And then statistics will show that you'll get there. So um, Taylor, I wanted to continue with the story of Slingshot, getting into more of the present time. When was the moment that you knew that this company was definitely a legitimate company? What was going on in that time? Tell us about um, how things were with, with you and, and the company. Tell us about that moment when you knew that it was a company that you were going to be working for. So there was a couple moments, I would say, that there were most impactful and memorable early on one of them was was kind of what i already shared where you know we, we'd already been doing something similar for eight to ten months and had a feel for what it was like to take those calls and how that business was working and how much our, our customers enjoyed the service we provided I also had the context of starting a number of companies as an undergrad i'd have been involved in probably five so I had something to compare Slingshot to in terms of the reception of clients and how difficult it was to make money and have paying customers. Yeah. And so with that in mind, um, it was just very early on the reception that we got from that first person we cold called and a few mm -hmm. of those first 10 that transitioned to our new business model was really good. Like they were just saying, yeah, you're, you guys are onto something here. I like where you're going. Yeah. Absolutely. I'll send you the calls after hours. I'll see what you can do. We were getting a lot more, just something 
special about the way they were responding yeah. to the concept. And then as we performed the service and took the calls, um, making the sales and putting together the solution, um, although it was 24 seven and that was tricky, it was substantially easier than what we had already been doing for a number of reasons. The sales leads were better and they were easier to convert. And we just were able to focus on conversion and we didn't have to focus on generating the lead. Not quite sure what made it that way, but it was noticeably easier. And then what that turned into was our clients paying us more. We were almost immediately making more money and they were referring businesses that they knew. We had referrals after yeah. month one. Huge. So it was this like, this comparison of my gosh, this is so much better than what we were doing in every way. And it was, it was just so clear. So that was big where it, it just, it felt like we were onto something special. I mean, it also felt that way compared to the previous five or six businesses I had done. Slingshot was by far um, just the most well-received in all those ways. Yeah. And then there was another moment about a year, a little over a year in, uh, we'd, we'd been growing nicely and having success and we didn't have much money, but we wanted to go to the big industry trade show and we were debating it and we decided to, to pay about the 10 grand. I think that it cost to go. We decided to go and we had a really small booth in the back of the trade show. We put together some really chintzy marketing materials. You know, we were getting folks on <laughs> Fiverr to like make little infographics for us. I mean, it was really yeah. cheap, but. We got, we got it done and the reception at the trade show was phenomenal. We, we had so much interest and it was kind of the same thing we experienced when we did those first cold calls. It was just people yeah. were really excited by it. We signed a lot up, we got a lot of leads and we left that on a huge high, just feeling like, you know, this is, this is something. Like we definitely have a business that can scale uh, we believe this is probably useful for a lot of industries, even outside of pest control. But at a minimum, yeah. it's working in this in this industry, and we're off to the races. And so those two moments combined were just really exciting, and and we felt like, yeah, we've got a great business yeah. here. So Taylor, do you think that because it went so well in the beginning that you scaled too fast? Did you think that you and your company did that, or do you feel like it was uh, growing at a at an appropriate pace? Um, I think there's an argument that we scaled a little bit too fast for the financing that was available and yeah. the experience level of the folks that were on our team. But I wouldn't say we scaled too fast. You know, I, I think we scaled too slow. Um, out mm. the gate, we wanted to, there's different styles of entrepreneurship. There's types of entrepreneurship that, the purpose is to generate a tremendous income for the CEO or the founders. And that's the point. And if you can do that and you're each making 200 grand a year, then it's good. Business doesn't need to grow beyond that. More of a lifestyle yeah. play. And there's a lot of different types of businesses. And the type that I was always intrigued by was a company that went from zero to a hundred million in a fairly short period of time. And it grew very fast. And so we were trying to build that. And so mm -hmm. because of that, I, I wanted to grow faster than we did still grew yeah. fast, but it was a little too slow for, for my taste. And, um, I think some of the challenges that we had in the middle were just, uh, part and parcel for trying to grow that fast. It's pretty common for companies that are on a trajectory that way. And looking back, I, I probably should have tried to get a few more folks that were experienced in different areas of the business in the door sooner and um, got our financing in a stronger position earlier on. Um, so I see it more as like, I, I should have tactically made some operational changes to meet the, the pace of the growth, but yeah. I wouldn't say we grew too fast, you know? Yeah. So how did, how did you specifically get into the convention that you're talking about? Was it as simple as a phone call or what, what exactly went into that uh, getting into you know, the convention to spark more interest? Yeah, it's, it's not, it's not really difficult to get into most trade shows or conventions. You know, we just got online and we Googled um, pest control trade shows 
And then we noticed that there was one big one that was the, the biggest for the whole industry nationwide and had multiple thousands of people that show up and hundreds of vendors that showcase their product on the trade show. Um, and so we just filled out the form and called them up and, um, and paid the fee, uh, booked the tickets, got the hotel, and it was as simple as that. Really cool. So after the convention, um, at this point, it sounds like you had been running the company for about a year, a little bit over a year until that happened. What was the next big uh, happening in Slingshot that you can remember was another very big uh, movement for you and the company? What, what came after that that you think was another uh, position of scale for you? There's a, there's a few milestones to point for, you know, this may not be the case as much anymore now that so many companies are remote slingshot included, but early on we were not remote. You know, we had an office and our first office was, I don't know, a thousand square feet. You know, it was not very big. It was one big room that we all worked in and getting back from the trade show, having this huge swell of new customers, we, felt like, well, we've got to grow. And, and so there was a bigger space that was, you know, five to 10 times the size of our current office space that was available down the hall in the same building. And, um, and we, we bought a lease to that. So filling that out with workstations and getting moved into that space was a moment for us. It was like a big milestone because you can just visually see our company's growing because our office space is bigger. Yeah. Um, so that was fun. And, and that was a, it was a good growth year. And then um, that happened again. You know, we grew again to another space. We outgrew that one in 16 and 17, grew to a big headquarters in um, same complex, but different building that was around 15,000 square feet. So it was about three to four times nice. the size of the second one. And we got office space in Salt Lake. And so building out those big offices was another visualization of we're growing, we're doing this. And we certainly had been growing revenue and customers along the way. Um, Made a couple of our first external hires that hadn't grown up with the company that had outside experience towards the end of 2017, beginning of 2018. So that was our first attempt to uh, bring some experience onto the leadership team. That was a big moment for us. Um, and then I would say our, our equity round, you know, but going through this period of time, so short on cash, finally had decided, you know what, maybe doing an equity investment from a VC isn't so bad and we should explore that. And so we, we raised a little shy of two and a half million dollars from um, a venture capitalist group in Park City along with some successful angel investors that were in the state. And that happened early 2019. Um, and that was another great moment for us because it gave us, it gave us credibility. You know, you just, there's a exactly. sense of credibility when you're backed by um, prominent investors. It gave us help. You know, we had a real, real board meetings now where we could get real advice each quarter and it gave us two and a half million dollars, you know, where we could, invest in front of things and um, upgrade our software and bring on new leadership. Mm-hmm. And, and in line with that, another big milestone for us was towards the end of 2019, beginning of this year, 2020, uh, we got really serious about building uh, a experienced professional leadership team. And we filled out most of the traditional roles that you'll see in a business of our size, uh, a head of finance, a head of marketing, you know, a COO, a president, a, a real strong operator, director of client yeah. services, um, head of product, a CTO that had built really successful software and scaled software teams. All of those roles we hired and filled that team out. And yeah. watching that happen was, was, a, was a great moment because I, yeah. I really believed that they would have a big impact on our company. But now that we're into that experience of letting them lead the company in their departments for the last six to 12 months, um, the proof has been in the pudding. It's, it's been our best year ever. And I would attribute a yeah. lot of it to the strength of that team. Yeah. So Taylor, uh, last couple of questions that I want to ask you here. One being about 
uh, bringing on the leadership that you thought was necessary at the time. I interviewed somebody that was talking about the same thing. And he said that getting these people that are very valuable isn't very easy. They're doing other things. They're working other jobs, building these great companies elsewhere. So for you, how did you go about finding the people that were very, very useful for you? How did you get them on board with Slingshot when that time came? So took a, a few pronged approach. Like we just put up, we were very thoughtful about putting up the position in a job posting. And we took a lot of time, like we'd made individual landing page for some of the specific roles so that it was like very well thought out and articulated of here's what the role is. Here's what we have to offer you in terms of benefits, pay, equity. Here's why it's yeah. an exciting time to, like we, we took the, you know, the necessity to market that role serious and had a dedicated landing yes. page on our website for a few of the roles. And then we posted it all over the place, you know, on LinkedIn and Indeed and KSL and took normal inbound that that will do and ran it through our interview process. And then I reached out to folks that I felt like fit the category of experience we wanted on LinkedIn. Um, and I also reached out to my personal network. And through the combination of those things is how we found kind of our first tranche of experienced folks. And then when we did it again in late 219, um, I had never thought of doing this before, but I have a friend who's growing a business at effectively the same rate that I am. And he used uh, a search firm, a recruiting firm for a lot of his big really? roles and had a lot of success with it. And so I was like, you know what, I'll try it out. And so I used uh, a search firm in Utah and they were able to locate a few of the roles, you know, three or four of them they found and they were really great at what they did. So they went out and brought in really high caliber talent that I was then allowed to interview and try and convince to work at Slingshot. Mm -hmm. And there was also, I think, a little bit of momentum that builds with it when you do a lot of these at once. You know, as two or three came on, um, that created some excitement and they reached out to their network and they were able to refer a few in that filled other roles. And it kind of had a compounding effect where we we ended getting, you know, eight to 10 of these roles over a three month period. And I'd say, you know, the most important part of this second phase of doing it was probably the search firm that really got yeah. after it for us. Well, wow. So, so Taylor, the last thing that I wanted to touch on here, a question that I try to ask all my guests, uh, this question is if you were to have some newer entrepreneur, some person that wanted to be in the uh, same phase or, or position that you are, and they asked for one attribute that they should master uh, to become successful as an entrepreneur, what would that one attribute be? What would you tell them? That's a great question. I, I think I would probably say something related to being persuasive and being very comfortable and confident giving a presentation or convincing someone to do something that your business needs to survive. You know, and the big pegs of that that fundamentally, it's all the same skill that works across all these pegs is like we just talked about, you have to be able to convince talented people to join your team and work with you, or you have little chance of success. You typically have to convince someone to give you money, you know, whether it's a VC or a bank or family and friends, you've got to convince someone to believe in you and lend you some cash. And um, you usually need to kind of lead the effort on convincing a few customers to try you out in the beginning. You've got to be your company's first VP of sales. And, and those three things are done in almost the same way. It's the same types of skills that allow you to do those. It's all sales. And so I think getting comfortable giving presentations, convincing people, to do things that can be a win-win and help your company just selling in general mm -hmm. is probably the most important attribute that can help you be successful out the gate. Yeah. That's the one thing I think out of all the questions that I've asked, you know, to these entrepreneurs, that's the one thing that I would say if I was on the, you know, 
other seat. So it's just very, it's just square one of growing anything of being, you know, successful is just like getting people behind you. And, um, I, I just believe in it a hundred percent that it's so important, but Taylor, that's yeah. everything that I had for you. Um, if you want to just shoot out any, any links you have for us to find you, uh, do that now and then we can say goodbye. Yeah. I think the best way to connect is feel free to connect on LinkedIn. You know, I don't, I don't know what my actual URL is. I can send it to you, Josh, and maybe you can throw it in the, the post clip, but I've, it's, it's something to the effect of Jay Taylor Olson, you know, and if you just Google that name at slingshot, I'm sure my LinkedIn profile will pop up and connect with me. Cool. All right, guys find Taylor, uh, on LinkedIn. Um, I will have the, uh, profile URL in the uh, show notes if I can find it. But Taylor, I want to thank you so much for uh, taking the time. It was awesome to meet you. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Josh. Great to meet you too. Of course. Thanks. Cool. All right, man. Let me end the recording real quick and then...